So we just went through an example that had two nice derivatives. However, the function was not continuous. So we're going to have the mixed derivative theorem. Pink. <laughs> All right. Can you even see? No, you can't see pink. All right. I deleted some favorite pens because I uh, they were too thick for this zoom level. So I deleted a couple of the, I think it's the two thicker pens, and they just filled in the empty spots. Oh, I lost my green. No, oh, whatever. I do have pink. I think the second one is good. <laughs> so there's going to be a lot of, I'm going to write five things instead of drawing commas everywhere. I'm just going to space them out. So if these five functions are defined and continuous in an open disk or set, around some x equals a point, then fxy has to equal fyx for all x inside this open set. Let's give this a name, an open set, we'll call it s. For all purposes, this could be an epsilon disk centered at a. And I think I wrote them capital D for disk. Epsilon is the radius, and then the center is A. Then the partial derivatives have to be equal. So I don't think I've talked about fxy and fyx. I've talked about f little x, but not f little xy or f little yx. So let's do notation briefly. Ooh, and we're partial derivatives, so you use the right partial d. So we saw these two before. Little x, little y is a partial derivative with x, partial derivative with y. So obviously fxy and fyx are mixed partials, but the order is a little tricky. So let's use the usual order, or the usual notation. Which derivative do I take first in this notation? dx. So I'm going to write this as, I'm going to apply some order of or associativity. So I'm going to go, obviously, you don't need this, but I'm just writing it on so we know we're going x first. So copy over ddy. And we got fx. So we're going to take the y derivative. So we could write it as fxy or this order right here. So with extra parentheses, it looks like fx in parentheses and y outside. So what happened to the x, y, the order? 
They started out, it looked like y was first and then x was second. y was on the left, dy is on the left, dx is on the right. Because it's an operator. And it's, yeah, it's going to operate basically on what's adjacent to it. So when we look at this last one, f, x, y, the x is going to operate on sort of what's up to the left. And then when that's done, y is going to operate on what's up to the left. So operators work a little bit differently. They operate sort of on what's closest to them. So that's why the x goes first, y goes second. So that's a little bit strange. It's reverse order that you actually ought. You actually read this sort of right, no, left to right. So the x first, y second. So we'll do the exact same thing, but opposite for the x first, y second in regular notation. Don't need all these parentheses anymore. So this is f, y, x. Do the y derivative first, the x derivative second. So our conclusion of our theorem was the mixed partials f, x, y is equal to f, y, x. So it's saying if all your derivatives are continuous, then the mixed have to match. Doesn't matter if you go x derivative or y derivative first, they better be equal. So let's look at this. So these are supposed to be, in this mixed derivative theorem, these are supposed to be defined and continuous. Let's see if our derivative was defined and continuous, not just at, so this last crazy example, not just at 0, 0, but in an open set around 0, 0. So we'll zoom in on our awesome picture. So we took derivatives at 0, 0. We didn't take derivatives at any other point. So let's look at a point that's close to 0, 0. Uh, oh, we use pink, look at that. All right, what if I went to that point? So I think the x derivative, pretty obvious, that'll be fine, right? Go left, right, hey, you're always 0, slope 0, easy. What about the y derivative? If I approach, oh, what if I approach downwards like that? It's not continuous, and the slope would be uh, basically be infinitely steep right there. So the slope would be undefined. I'd be falling off the edge. Right, if I wrote out the values, what would they look like? Uh, using the limit. So whatever x value I want to use, just don't use zero. I'll just, I'll just choose negative one, how about that? I, it doesn't matter what x value I really pick as long as it's not zero. I'll have the exact same y values above it. It doesn't look great on my screen. It looks like Barbie calculus. <laughs> so we need all right, y two. So we'll write f of so our x-coordinate would be negative 1, our y-coordinate will be 0 plus h minus f of negative 1 comma 0 divided by, was that just divided by h? I think it was. All right, so I just picked intentionally negative 1 in for x. Nothing really changes if I use negative 1 versus negative 1 half versus any other negative value for x. So I'm just going to go right there. Let's simplify our difference quotient before we take our limit. So what is f of, now our x value is negative 1, and our h, we'll say our h is greater than 0, we'll go for a downwards derivative right here, and then I could go h less than 0 for the upwards derivative. All right, what value does our function have above negative 1? You can look over here. See, the choice are 0 or 1. It's got one. 
So it doesn't have zero because if you look, x times y is not zero. It's whatever, it's negative h, not zero. So we got one minus, what is f of negative one comma zero? That's gonna be zero. So that was all algebra, no calculus right there. And now I'm going to apply a limit. Well, we have that bad h right there. Bad h isn't going anywhere. So this limit's undefined. So what that means, no matter uh, how far I go to the left, even the tiniest little bit, I don't have a y derivative right there. So I can write, summarizing, f y d n e when, so we, I really just did it at negative one zero, but I could have put any value in there, any small negative value. And this will work for any epsilon greater than zero. So however close I wanted to move to the origin, it would work. So we just showed that moving over a tiny bit to the left, we got no y derivative. The intuition is it's infinitely steep. You fall off that little one foot tall cliff. So your slope's infinity. So any questions on that why that dy, or why the uh, partial derivative of y doesn't work at that particular value? I could pick any, there wasn't anything special about that. I can go to any point that's not the origin and have the same problem. Uh, with the exception of, what happens if I actually picked a point up here that wasn't on either axis? What would our derivatives be in both directions? How much change is happening? Zero. Zero. So if I zoom in, if I go this direction, no change. Well, don't go that far, but that direction, no change. Height's always one right there. So derivative will exist just fine except it won't exist on the axis away from the origin. So this has an OK derivative. I should say OK derivatives. And this one right here was a DNE. All right, so this does not pass that mixed derivative. It doesn't have the uh, continuous or existing mixed derivatives. So there's our function right there. So we'll just write our note off to the right. Well, I didn't even have to go as far as the mixed derivatives. The fy does not exist close to 0, 0. So I can't take a y derivative. I can take it at some close values, but not every close value. I'd have the exact same problem if I took an x derivative on a point up here. If I took an x derivative, i get that it was undefined, infinitely steep, because it would be falling off the edge the same way. All right, so that fails the mixed derivative theorem. So we'll do a computation right now. So that was the end of our notation. When w equals x, y plus e to the y over y squared plus one. So I want you to find two partial derivatives. So first find w, x, y. which of course you get the x derivative first because it's close to w and the y derivative second. So go ahead and compute this derivative right now. So really a double derivative. So it's gonna get ugly, you got a quotient rule and then you're gonna come back and take another derivative after you do the quotient rule for the x. 
Actually, it won't be so bad. You'll see. When you take your extra derivative, what's constant? Y. Y, or any other variables for that matter. But this one, all your y's will be constant. So do you really have a quotient rule for your extra derivative? No. Nope, because <laughs> that's all constant. So your y derivative, your x derivative is not bad, and then your y derivative is almost trivial. I didn't really look at it very carefully when I said it's going to be a quotient rule. So now compute the mixed partial with the y first, x second. Now you ha you better use the quotient rule. So what is the x derivative of all this mess? One. One. All that's the constant right there. Yep, so the second part's all constant. All right, so our mixed partials are the same thing. Uh, say that again? Uh, just because they were the same for this doesn't mean they'll be the same for all x's, does it? Or for all? So, so we didn't put any actual x, y values in here. So we didn't evaluate at any point. So this works anywhere this function is defined, basically. Right. And this particular one on the real numbers has no uh, vertical asymptotes. Well, that's a, not the best. The domain for this function is everything in R2. There's no, you can't divide by 0. Because, y squared. Yeah. yeah, as long as you got real inputs, you you'll have uh, you'll never be divided by zero here. So I don't really want to write the definition of differentiable. I don't think it'll be very useful. So let's write the corollary to the definition of differentiable. So we're going to take this to be the definition of differentiable, but this is actually the corollary, uh, which is the useful part of it. If fx and fy exist and are continuous, close to x equals a, and here close, we'll take close to be the epsilon disk around A. Then F is differentiable. So here's our if then. So the first part hypothesis, your two derivatives exist, and they're continuous.
not just at A, but close to A. So that's very important. So they have to be existing and continuous, not just at the A value, but close by. A super short version. Continuous first derivatives. Continuous first derivatives imply diffable. Now it's important continuous first derivatives close to A, not just at A. So that part is very important. So if we take this to be the def definition of differentiable, now diffable at x equals a implies continuous at x equals a. So we got diffable implying continuous now. And remember, differentiable is really a property that happens not at A itself, but also around A. All right, time for the chain rule. So we'll start out with a two a function with two inputs if w is f of xy and x is really a function of t and y is some other function of t and we're going to let alpha of t equal this x of t y of t So this is all things we've done before. Alpha is a path function that takes some time and traces out some curve. It's got an x and a y output. And of course, we're going to feed f alpha. So we're going to go f of alpha of t. So we're going to feed it the path. And I want to know, I want to find the t derivative. Chain rule. So you've seen the chain rule before. In this case, it's going to be a little bit different, though. So what's the problem with just writing f prime right here? So I can write this. You don't write this down right now, though. What is f prime? Think about it. Derivative of f. That say what's yep. So with what? 
there's two choices. F doesn't normally eat T's. So that's right. Is it X or Y? So what we're going to do is come through and we're going to pick. So it's going to be FX. Now when we do an X derivative, what do you think we need to multiply for the chain rule out here? Now we need to multiply by X prime of T. So this is how the function f changes when x changes, multiplied by how x changes. And we do the same thing for y. So take the y derivative of f with its original inputs. And we have to multiply by y prime of t at the end. That's a really ugly t. And you can write this out as df dx. You have to go partials because f takes two x and a y variable. So there's two derivatives you could take. So this is partial f with respect to x times x prime of t is regular dx, regular dt. And the second part is partial f, partial y multiplied by dy dt. So what if we had a, this is in two variables, what if we had three variables instead of two? Yep, same trick except at the end you go with z's basically. And if I had four variables, there would be four things added together, five variables, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll just write this like last version right here. So if g goes from r3 to r2, no, r3 to r1, and we'll take I don't want to reuse alpha t. Let's go beta t. So we have some x t, y t, z t. Then the t derivative of g of beta t. That's g x d x d t plus gy dy dt plus gz dz dt. This is a notation that required the least amount of writing of all the ones I could think of. So this looks kind of tricky right here. So how can we think of this in a different way? There's a few ways to do it. So I think your book does a vertical chart like this. So your input t goes into three coordinates, x, y, and z, and then goes to those three form one output. So how do you go from x to w? It'll be wx, wy, wz. And this one will be dz, dt, dy, dt, dx, dt. So this is sort of how it's lined up. And then you just add together the three branches. So 
So there's a new operator. It's not really, it's just notationally new. And it's, I believe it's called the gradient operator. So the gradient is a triangle, except this upside down triangle from the way we normally write them. So it turns a function from n dimensions, ooh, that should be an n, not a two. So our x input is really n dimensional. And that n dimensional input, where does it get sent to? So normally, our function, if you just look at what is f of x1, x2, xn, it equals some value. Uh, we've been using w a lot. I want to stick with w here. So w is some combination of x1 through xn, it's right there. So we're going to do is take a partial derivative of f for each of the n variables. So we're going to send this to fx1, fx2, fxn. So we're going to take one function and turn it into n different partial derivatives, deri partial derivative functions. That's a little weird because there's n outputs, n output functions, and partial derivatives you can take. So we're going to take an alpha path function going from n dimensions into, whoa, that should be the way around. from one dimension, usually a time dimension into n dimensions. How many dimensions, or what, what dimension is the input for this f of alpha of t? So what is this function eating? There is some n-dimensional, but what is the actual input for this function? How many? So what is the input for this function? T. So there's really one dimensional input. And how many dimensions is the output? So our function f goes from n dimensions to one dimension. So it's a function from r1 to r1. It does go through n dimensions in between, but it comes back to one dimension. So it would make sense to say, what is ddt of this function? And the shortcut way to write this The gradient of f, so what's the gradient function? It's the one I just defined up here. It's all the partial derivatives lined up next to each other. But remember, each partial derivative, it still has n variable input. So it's, you're still inputting alpha of t into there. And this dot is for dot product. Dot product with the t derivative of the alpha of t function. So this is also the chain rule right here.
So why is this a chain rule? Let's think about what this gradient of depth looks like. Let's go way down two dimensions so things are not bad. So we'll go to two dimensions. The easiest one that's not trivial. So we got f of x, y. The gradient of f is the x derivative comma y derivative. Now remember, when you take a derivative, you still get the same input, same number of dimensions of input that you originally had. That doesn't change. So what is gradient of f when you plug in alpha of t? That's just fx alpha t fy alpha t. You're just going to change the input from xy to alpha t. And what is the t derivative of alpha of t? So alpha better be two dimensions. I should write that down somewhere. So this particular alpha has x, t, y, t. So the t derivative alpha of t is x prime y prime. So what do I get when I dot product gradient f alpha t dot d d t alpha of t. So I'm dot producting, dotting, whatever verb that is, these two together. So you're multiplying x coordinates plus multiplying y coordinates together. So fx alpha t times x prime of t plus fy alpha t times y prime of t. So you end up multiplying the partial derivative times uh, of alpha of t times the t derivative of the input. So right now you should be thinking, oh, this is confusing. Give me a problem so I can make this less confusing. So let's do that. So our function, and this is, you can call this f of x, y, z, is x, y plus z along path alpha t equals cos t sine t t. So things we need, we need gradient of f, or all the partials of f. Once you have that, we need gradient of f of alpha of t. And once we have that, we can finally get the easy part will be alpha prime t. You've been doing that for a while. Very easy to get alpha prime t. All right, I'll start out by getting f with partial with x. It's y. So I want you to get the other two partials. They're not bad.
So the difference between gradient f and gradient f of alpha of t is instead of plugging in x, y, z, wherever I see a y, I'm using the y equals sine t. Wherever I see a x, I'm going to use x equals cos t. So I'm just substituting out. Then 1, it doesn't matter what I'm inputting, it's going to be 1. Unfortunately, that looks very similar to alpha prime of t. I just realized that. Yes. Which has gotten in a completely different way, which is just the derivative of alpha of t. Unfortunately, it's almost the exact same thing. Coincidental. It generally does not happen. And of course, what is, I want ddt of f of alpha of t. So it's the gradient f of alpha t dot alpha prime t. So I'm going to take those two and dot them together. Good news is they're right above each other. So I can just look vertically and multiply, plus, multiply, plus, multiply. So we get negative sine squared plus cos squared plus 1. And somewhere along the way I said f was w. This is really dw dt. So this will seem very confusing at first. You do a few problems, it's really not that bad. You just have to do things the right order. The function composition can be one of the trickiest parts. And just to warn you, we're about to go, the next thing we're going to do is take a, make alpha go from m dimensions into n dimensions. So it's going to get a little bit more mixed up. Did I, question? So is f of alpha of t, is that w, like, did we actually get the dw over dt? Yeah. So, it's a good question. So w is x, y plus z, but we also approached along this x, y, z path. So I wanted the w derivative with respect to t along this alpha path. So then that final answer would be? Uh, it, I can't write dw over dt unless I have t's in there, and I did that because I approached on this specific alpha path right there. If I didn't have this part, the question wouldn't make sense. I could ask what is dw and, or what is uh, the w with x derivative, w with y derivative, w with z derivative, but I couldn't say a t derivative. But if I approach on a path that has t's in it, then I can ask about t derivatives.